Welcome to Ferment Radio, a podcast series that takes you deep into the fascinating world of microbes. My name is Aga Pokrywka, and I invite you to join us in a conversation with people from the most diverse backgrounds, including science, gastronomy and arts, to develop new recipes for living on a broken planet. Bacteria are often considered as the ugly and stinky ones. It is something dangerous which wants to creep on us. We want to protect ourselves from it. There are not many ways, as fermentation is, in which we go over that prejudice and find pleasure and beauty in what many love. One of these few ways is art. Working with microbes art utilizes microorganisms as metaphors and aesthetic experiences. But do the things need to be made pretty to talk to us? In this episode, we journey through the aesthetics of artistic work of Anna Dumitriou, whose interdisciplinary practice merges art, science and technology to explore themes of health, disease and the societal impact of scientific progress. Anna collaborates closely with scientists and historians, incorporating biological materials like bacteria and DNA into her installations, sculptures and performances. Through her work, she challenges viewers to reconsider common perceptions of the natural world. Shielding. Throughout a room, a palette of cool shades of grey prevails punctuated only by sporadic accents of white, casting an ethereal pallor over the space. Amidst this subdued ambience lies a collection of small beds, arranged in disarray. Each simple, hospital-like bed, adorned with delicate, handmade pillows and blankets, stands as a solitary island amidst the desolation. The atmosphere whispers of abandonment, yet hints of comfort linger in the air juxtaposing the stark surroundings. This tableau, frozen in time, beckons the viewer to unravel its secrets, to ponder the forgotten stories that haunt these vacant beds. The scene seamlessly blends traditional feminine crafts, such as sewing, embroidery, and natural dyeing, with 3D printing based on digital reconstructions of hospital beds from the first temporary COVID hospitals in Wuhan. These beds symbolize the dreams that were dreamed, perhaps of having a room of one's own, a space that many lacked during the pandemic, especially those fearing domestic abuse. You were like a reflecting on the topic of pandemics like a way before. So when it really started to happen, it had to be quite... It's crazy to say, but maybe even exciting for you to experience it. What was what was interesting was how boring it was, really, isn't it? You know, apart from like, thank God it was boring from my perspective. And um, but you know, this this rather than you know something more traumatic. But I mean, obviously, a lot of people suffered very traumatic experiences. But um, but I think for on an everyday level, it was it, it's the interesting the banality of it all. You know, battles over toilet rolls and and oh god, the news so boring um so it's uh, so obsessive and there's just like the same thing as if nothing else was happening in the world which i mean it seemed like at that time um and 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 it's an interesting way they sort of create these these situations as well um and uh, yeah so so reflecting on like plague history i mean plague a lot worse you know it killed a third of the population of you of of Europe and and half the population of China at one point. So, you know, it's it's much much more horrific. And we have now we have drug resistant strains of of Yersinia pestis uh, circulating in uh, Madagascar um 
in the rodent population. Um, it's not a serious drug resistant because we can get around it in other ways at the moment. But the idea that you could have a drug resistant plague strain circulating that that now that's that's something that can kind of shock people into reflection about issues of antibiotic resistance and things like that, which I'm really passionate about and like thinking about that. Antibiotic resistance quilt. Upon a darkened expanse, a mesmerizing patchwork quilt unfolds. A tapestry of stories stitched in hues that dance amidst the shadows. Crafted with meticulous care, it marries tradition with the ominous whispers of a looming threat. Vibrant threads weave tales of resistance. The quilt is impregnated with actual traces of the most significant drug-resistant bacteria, such as strains of Klebsiella pneumonia, E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Enterococcus faecalis, Enterobacter cloacae, Neisseria gonorrhea, and methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Some of the patches of silk have polka dots where discs of antibiotic impregnated paper have been effective in preventing the bacteria from growing. In others, the bacteria swarms right across the silk, unabated. Hints of warmth peek through the gray, a beacon amidst the encroaching darkness, yet beneath the surface lies a silent battle where antibiotics and bacteria engage in a deadly dance of survival. The resistance to antibiotics, it's, it's a very big topic, one of the kind of a silent world problems. I don't think that so many people are talking about it. And actually, I just recorded like a few weeks ago, two different episodes with two different people on that topic, because I thought like uh, this really needs much more attention also within Fairman Radio. And we were talking mostly about the metaphors around antimicrobial resistance. There's always this kind of a war, let's say, storytelling around it. And maybe you could tell us a bit more like how you've been working on this, on this topic of uh, antimicrobial resistance. Well, I've been working quite a lot with genomics technologies and things like that. So um, looking at like the antibiotic resistance genes in the Staphylococcus aureus that lives on my body, which is is uh, penicillin resistant, as 80% of Staph aureus is. I've um, been working a lot with tuberculosis as well. Um, so I've made big installations. I'm working with um, the Cryptic Project at the University of Oxford, um, which is part of Modernising Medical Microbiology. And they were the first people anywhere in the world to uh, get basically all TB cases in the UK are routinely whole genome sequenced. So they know the um, what antibiotic resistances these have and they can track them and they can see how they're spreading. It's it's in the UK enough that it's that you can you can get some data and interesting data, but it, it's it's um, not in the UK enough that it, it gets too fuzzy, that the data's so fuzzy, it's quite still pretty rare to get TB in the UK. So and it is actually improving since all these, you know, all these public health interventions with with using the cutting edge like genomics technologies. And now their research has led to they did a huge global project which I was um, working on an installation about during the early stages of the pandemic um, and before which uh, they they can identify from the genome of a TB which of the first four frontline antibiotics can be used to treat it. So this is very groundbreaking. It's never been done before. It's a protocol that can now be applied to other organisms. You can look at the genome and you can see what not just what resistance genes it has, but whether it will actually be treatable by it. And they did this by growing 10,000 patients TB around the world in 14 well plates in the presence of different antibiotics. Coming back. In a bright room, a door stands as a silent sentinel, bearing the weight of untold secrets within its golden embrace. Crafted from weathered wood, its surface etched with patterns reminiscent of its past. 
This antique door has been carved with textures that evoke the damage caused in the lung by tuberculosis. The antique door handle, originating from a former TB sanatorium, bears a two-bar cross symbolizing the American Lung Association's crusade against TB. Upon closer inspection, the patterns reveal themselves as a mosaic of colored circles, evoking images of unseen forces at play. The antique brass handle, marked with the emblem of a bygone crusade against disease, adds to the door's enigmatic allure. This door serves as a reminder that diseases like TB cannot be shut out. It speaks to the impact of colonialism on modern disease and seems prescient in light of recent border closures, traffic light systems, and quarantines. Genomic research has revealed that the main strain of TB circulating in India, the country with the highest TB burden, is a Euro-American strain brought to India by British and European colonialists and rapidly spread among a population with little immunity. I'm also doing some work with um, the National Collection of Type Cultures where I'm artist in residence, which is the oldest collection of pathogenic bacteria in the world. And they they had um, their oldest thing in their collection um, is um, is a uh, Vibrio cholerae from 1915, in uh, which was taken from a British soldier in Alexandria in Egypt. And they're researching it at the uh, Wellcome Sanger Institute. And there are two interesting things about this. So they don't think it's the cholera that probably killed the chap, if, he, if indeed he died. I think he did. Um, because it's not the very virulent strain. Um, but it, it doesn't have flagella. It's lost its flagella. It's lost its ability to swim. And um, it's resistant to penicillin. Wow, so resistance was already out there. Yeah, exactly. You've got it. Um, because, yeah, penicillin wasn't even identified by Fleming until like 1928. Um, the experiments to make it into a drug didn't start, and, well, the, the actual trials in humans didn't start till 1941. But there it is in the environment, 1915. The resistance genes are out there. It's the environmental pressure that we apply to them um, that causes the drug resistance in hospitals and things like that. Another really weird thing that I read recently was that uh, actually MRSA first evolved in hedgehogs. It sounds mad, but it's a really proper paper. We don't know where it first evolved, but it is definitely predates the human um, MRSA. Maybe it's another proof, you know, that it is not so that everything is caused by by human, you know, this humanocentric kind of a way of thinking. I think that, you know, like uh, there is this uh, notion that world was, was once in a perfect state and then something went wrong and now we need to come back to this perfectness which was before. And to me, it's really, uh, I think it's a construct because we do not know how it was before. And even if we would know, like, uh, is it, there is no way to come back to something, you know, which have been, like, you need to go forward. But I think it's inevitable to think that, you know, future should be about the collaboration or blurring the border between the disciplines. Like, uh, most of uh, the most ground, ground, groundbreaking things which are happening these days in the world are exactly because these divisions got weaker or diluted or people started just to talk to each other. Of course, your work would not be able to exist if not exactly this blurring, the borders between the disciplines. But I see also there another thing because I think that as long, I mean, for sure you'll, you'll you collaborate with a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary specialists or, you know, people who really know what they are doing. But you are also within yourself becoming a hybrid because you would not be able to have a dialogue with people out of the different, you know, disciplines than art, which is your background, uh, than if you would not make this collaboration first within yourself, right? And maybe I wanted to 
to hear like your reflection on that because exactly this collaboration within us is something which really interests me. And I don't think there is so much, you know, of a research on that. There is a lot of research, like how to make, you know, artists and scientists work, but uh, how can we become hybrids? Um, I mean, I, I don't like to call myself a hybrid, really. I like to call myself an artist because I think that people are so ready to throw away the term art. Um quite often in in this field and I think it's really important so I see art as a kind of meta discipline or an umbrella discipline that allows you to explore lots of disciplines but I'm not ready to throw away the term art I'm not somewhere between art and science I'm art and art encapsulates everything to to me really um and you can like if you're trying to understand the world you need to understand history you need to understand the science side, you need to understand how it affects people, how it makes people feel, the visceral kind of side, um, the beauty. And, and that, I would go a bit further. I think it, it needs to take all its, all the various things, like every field needs to kind of go outside of itself. Um, it, I think fields are an artificial construct, really, to be honest. Do you see over all the years uh, you work as an artist on those topics related to microbiology and beyond, do you see the change in, for example, you enter the lab, you enter institution which normally is not so open for artists, but you manage to you know, work there in the lab next to the scientists out there. Do you see the change in, in how this collaboration goes? Is it like uh, more open now or maybe less or maybe something else? So some places are definitely opening up more. Like Germany's sort of quite interested in this stuff now. I, I don't know because I'm usually like the forerunner. <laughs> and then maybe other people, because um, I, I have worked in a lot of places where they've never had artists before and... Um, I don't know whether they'll have more or or whether they just like working with me. I mean, it's difficult because artists are not the same. So I've done a little bit in the lab, started talking to people working with um, quantum biology now. So my brain might fall out um, before the next <laughs> year or two. <laughs> yeah, no, we've been working with lasers and uh, sort of basically fluorescent um, fluorescent proteins, but. Um, but these fluorescent proteins are in um, uh, the photons in a superposition. It's all very exciting. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm still trying to get a handle on it. If I'm a creative person, I should be able to be creative, like as the need arises. And so to put myself into these these new situations, I mean, there are aspects to quantum biology that relate to things like antibiotic resistance and things, or there may be like how these molecules pass through things and how it all works. It might, you know, they're, they're looking at things like how can you, like how does, they're actually looking at like how does quantum biology or how might quantum biology impact tuberculosis? They're researching that. There are, there are there's a conference coming up. So um, I think it's, it, it's important to kind of go there even if I'm like I don't really understand because when I first started doing work with genomics which is about 2010 um I didn't understand it at all um and I just embedded myself in it and then I I got the scientists to teach me the entire pipeline uh, the genomics pipeline from extracting the DNA of different microorganisms like TB and and staph aureus and things like that and then how you whole genome sequence them and how you do the bioinformatics I taught myself that as well and then we worked with the data that I produced so um as w as well as the organisms and all sorts of things so I'm a great believer in just sort of throwing myself in and learning it hands-on with the scientists fermenting futures a glass vessel stands as a beacon of innovation and mystery Within its transparent confines, an intricate network of plastic tubes weaves a tapestry of a time to come, intertwining with the vessel's sleek surface in a dance of industrial elegance. The bottle is partially filled with bubbly, milky liquid containing modified Pichia pasteurized yeast, capable of simultaneously capturing carbon and producing lactic acid for the manufacture of biodegradable PLA plastic for 3D printing. 
as shadows play upon it. Pinkish shapes decorating the bottle surface come into view. They are 3D printed yeast forms, including one incorporating yeast produced PLA plastic swarming across the container. Do you think it would be possible to the solution or experiments you are proposing to make them somewhat on a bigger scale? Is it something which would be ever interesting to you? I don't know. For example, regarding this fermenting futures, you transform the yeasts to be able to, you know, eat up CO2 and produce plastic. Is it something like a simulation, an experiment, or it's something which actually, what if somebody patents it and, you know, make a business out of that? So I'm not interested in the science or patenting the science or something. I'm interested in the art and I get to keep, I get to own the art. I'm not interested in working at scale on the, uh, on the solution side. I'd like, I want to communicate it. I think the scientists that I work with are, are best placed to, to do that. I like the modernizing medical microbiology. I mean, they implemented this, this stuff, you know, globally. So, you know, it's, 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 they're very well placed to do all that. I'm very well placed to get people who don't know about that kind of stuff to stumble across it in a, in a magazine or on a website or maybe even the real exhibition and think about it and then maybe have a conversation with their friends about it and, and put it put that little seed in their mind. Like friends used to give a lot of talks and they'd talk about weak signals from the future. And I quite like this idea of the this sort of like, you know, it's it's a thing and you just sort of you first hear about it. And if you first hear about it in like not a, you know, oh genetic modification fear it fear it like there are ethical issues around not doing things as well as doing things so so you know not having antibiotics or like at the time not doing that as a treatment billions of people would have died of horrible bacterial infections um so it would be a very different situation so i'm not saying like we shouldn't do things but any solution provides it's a, a, another another problem and i i think sort of the world goes like that actually so as you come up with something and you're like because it is like the butterfly effect in a way you change something and then something else happens and and so i just think we need to be aware of it really <laughs> just to, that this idea that um there's always going to be something, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try and do things. And, you know, things generally sort of improve, although it might not seem that way. If you go back in history, it definitely improved because the life expectancy was about 40. You know, things things sort of generally improve, although it might not seem that way. And here again, we are reminded that if something doesn't show, doesn't happen into our face, Something which is beyond our senses and measuring scales. Something which is on the margins, as not insignificant as it might seem. If you liked this episode, please share it. If you would like to know more about the show, listen to this episode again, or find previous episodes, please go to fermentradio.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and more. We would love to know what you thought of this conversation, hear your human microbial stories and your suggestions for the future episodes. We are always looking forward to hearing from you at hello at fermentradio.com. You can also leave us an audio message by connecting to us on our Instagram. Ferment Radio is brought to you by Super Eclectic and is supported by Microbial Lives, Practices of New Human Microbial Cultures, a project at the center of the social study of microbes. I'm very grateful for this support and most of all, with all our amazing Ferment Radio listeners. Keep fermenting and stay tuned for the next episode of Ferment Radio.